All right, we are back with the second part of this lecture on the cardiac cycle and heart sounds, and now we're going to talk about cardiac output. Okay, so we've, we've been through the events of the cardiac cycle, and a couple of things I want you to recall right away, your end diastolic volume and your end systolic volume, referring to the volume of blood in your right and your left ventricle combined. And your EDV, that's the maximum volume of blood in the ventricles. ESV, or end systolic volume, is your minimum volume of blood left over in the ventricles after ventricular systole has occurred. Okay, so what is cardiac output? Cardiac output is a numerical value. It is a measurement of the volume of blood that is actually pumped out of your ventricles every minute. Okay, this is kind of an important number. And how do we calculate? There's a way to calculate this. It's your heart rate, your number of beats per minute, or HR, um, times your stroke volume. What is your stroke volume? All a stroke volume is, is that volume of blood that is pumped out of your ventricles with each heartbeat. Okay, and then how would we calculate this stroke volume? It would actually be your EDV, or the maximum amount of blood in your ventricles, after the atria have contracted and have squeezed that blood down into the ventricles, that's the maximum volume, minus your end systolic volume in the ventricles. So how much blood was left over after the ventricles squeezed as much out as they could up into the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. This is called your, uh, your uh, stroke volume. Okay, so let's move over here and look at a pretty simple calculation. Um, at rest, in an average adult, at rest, this is important, average adult heart rate is about 75 beats per minute. Um, earlier we saw that a typical stroke volume, we said an, a typical in diastolic volume in an adult is about 120 mils minus your end systolic volume in the ventricles is typically about 50 mils left over. 120 minus 50 gives you 70 mils per beat. So if you have a heart rate of 75 beats per minute, and if you are pumping 70 mils of blood out of your ventricles per beat, that gives you, all you do is multiply 75 times 70, which would come out to 5,000 250 milliliters, ML stands for milliliters, okay, uh, a milliliter is one one thousandth of a liter, so there are one thousand milliliters in a liter, so if you want to express this as liters, you take this number and you divide by one thousand, and that gives us 5.25. 5.25 liters per minute. Cardiac output is typically given in either milliliters per minute or liters per minute. Okay, um, now interestingly, so every minute your, your heart is pumping 5.25 liters of blood out of the ventricles. That's about the same volume of blood that's present in an average adult. So every minute, all of the blood in your body is passing through your heart um, one time if you are at rest. So that's pretty amazing to think about. You think about the journey of blood through your body and how it has to go into all those little microscopic blood vessels and um, um, be transported to those tissues, pass through the little tiny capillaries, move back into the the venules and the veins and return to the heart and all of your blood uh, does that, makes that full journey that you're learning about 
um, as part of your blood tracings every minute. That's pretty, uh, pretty remarkable. All right, your maximal cardiac output is about four to five times that volume. So you're getting up to around 25 liters, let's say, 20 to 25 liters per minute if you're a non-athletic person. If you're a well-trained athlete, like a marathon runner, triathlete, etc., your maximal cardiac output may approach 35 liters per minute, so almost seven times your normal cardiac output. That would mean that all of your blood is passing through your heart about seven times per minute. That's an amazingly fast um, amount of fast rate or speed of circulation. Um, okay, now let's think about this. Why? If you are running a marathon, why does your cardiac output need to go up? Well, what is your, what have you been learning about your, uh, the function of your blood in terms of delivering things to all of the cells in your body um, uh, and its role in, in carrying away the wastes. If you are vigorously exercising, your skeletal muscles and other parts of your body as well need a whole lot more oxygen, they need a whole lot more nutrients because they're going to be doing a whole lot more work and they need to be able to power that, power that work. So your, car, your cardiovascular system is uh, what transports these things to all these different parts of your body. So with increased demand, you have got to ramp up your cardiac output. And as you can see, sometimes you've got to ramp that up in a pretty dramatic way. Um, another phrase you should be familiar with, cardiac reserve, that's the, the difference between your resting and maximal cardiac output. So if you're a well-trained athlete and your maximal cardiac output is 35 liters per minute, let's say you're resting cardiac output is 5.25, that if we did the subtraction there, your cardiac reserve would be about 29.75 liters per minute. Um, and you, you may hear about cardiac reserve, you know, if you are um, an older person, you're starting to lose some of your cardiac function, uh, or if you're experiencing heart failure, uh, people who are experiencing heart failure, they don't have, their cardiac reserve is not nearly as large. So if they get into situations where they've got to ramp up that cardiac output, they're not able to do so. You know, that's why when your heart is failing, you can't climb stairs as well. If you're climbing stairs, uh, the demands of climbing stairs mean you've got to ramp up your cardiac output. And if you can't do that because you are um, experiencing heart failure, you're not going to be able to make it up the stairs as well. Okay, so there are lots of times when we have to increase our cardiac output, not just for running marathons and super strenuous activity, but other times of uh, lesser need as well, including if you are Scooby-Doo or Shaggy and their friends, Fred, if you're any of these guys you see here and you're being chased by a monster, oh yeah, you got to ramp up that cardiac output in order to be able to uh, run fast enough to get away from the monster. So that's another reason why you would need to ramp up your uh, cardiac output. Okay, so how are we going to, how do we ramp up our cardiac output when we need to? Let's look back over here at our calculation. So here's our math. Cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume, okay? So obviously, if you increase your heart rate, if that number gets bigger, this number is going to get bigger. That's going to increase, the, increase your cardiac output. However, also, if you increase your stroke volume, is there a way to squeeze more blood um, out of the ventricles with each heartbeat? If you can increase that, you will increase your cardiac output. The reality is both of these things are very important and both of them tend to happen at the same time when we need to increase our cardiac output. Um, 
there are three main factors that can affect your stroke volume. So remember, if we want to increase our cardiac output, we need to increase our stroke volume. Well, what are the three things that affect that stroke volume? Um, one of them is called preload, and we'll see more about what that means in a minute. Uh, a second one is contractility, which maybe you can already kind of figure out that that's the force of contraction of the ventricles. If you want to increase your stroke volume, you've got to squeeze more blood out of the ventricles. That makes sense. And then a third one is actually called afterload. So we'll see more preload and afterload are not quite as clear just by their, uh, by their names. Okay, so what is preload? Preload refers to how stretched the cardiac muscle cells or cardiac muscle fibers in the walls of your ventricles are before they contract. Okay, and there were a couple of guys named Frank and Starling a long time ago who generated the Frank Starling law of the heart, which is based on this degree of stretch of the cardiac muscle cells. Maybe you remember from Biology 201 that there is what is called a length tension relationship within the muscle fibers of your skeletal muscles. And all that means, if we think back to how down at a molecule, molecular level, what's required for a muscle cell to contract, you've got those actin filaments and you've got those myosin filaments and the two have to form cross bridges and then slide across each other in order for a, a muscle fiber to contract. All right, so before they ever start forming those cross bridges and sliding across each other, well, let's think about it. Let's say they're starting off right here before they form those cross bridges and start sliding. These two don't have very far to slide. Okay, so that's going to generate less contraction force. Let's say the muscle fiber is more stretched out to about here, and then your actin and your myosin filaments form a cross bridge. Well, now they've got more room to slide across each other, and that allows for greater contraction force. So hopefully you remember that from um, Unit 3 in Biology 201 where you learned about the muscular system and how that amount of pre-stretch of muscle fibers affects their strength of contraction. And the same is true for your cardiac muscle cells. The more they are stretched before contraction, the greater the contraction force. And again, that's going to be because your actin and your myosin filaments will, be, will have a greater span across which they can slide when they start forming those cross bridges. Okay, um, what can we do then? So one of the things that we can do to increase our stroke volume is stretch out those cardiac muscle cells in your right and your left ventricle more before the ventricles contract. How do we do that? How do we stretch the ventricles out? The best way to do that is to get more blood into the ventricles before the ventricles undergo, contra undergo contraction. So you increase your venous return. Um, the other thing you can do is actually slow down your heartbeat. Okay, a slower heartbeat will allow more blood, more time for passive filling of the ventricles, which allows more blood to flow down in there and more pre-stretching of the walls of the ventricles before they contract. So those are a couple of things. This is a really important one here, increased venous return or venous return. How do you increase venous return? Actually, when you're exercising, you're using your muscles vigorously, um, you're going to learn shortly about how blood flows back to your heart, but those contracting muscles will actually squeeze blood faster through your veins and back to your heart. So just the very nature of exercise itself will increase that venous return. Okay, so that's called preload. 
So getting more blood into the ventricles first, that is going to increase your end systolic volume, your ESV. No, I'm sorry, your, I'm sorry, your EDV, your end diastolic volume. Um, and just by nature of having more blood in your ventricles right before they contract, that's going to help increase your stroke volume as well. All right, second thing, increasing contractility. Now, like we said, affecting that preload, that pre-stretching, that in itself is going to cause the ventricles to contract with more force. Um, but there are a few other ways that you can stimulate your cardiac muscle cells and your ventricles to contract with more force as well. Um, again, this is called contractility. So these are things that increase the force of contraction um, independent of preload, and independent of that end diastolic volume in your ventricles. Uh, several different things can do this. Increasing calcium influx into your cardiac muscle fibers. Hopefully you remember back from Biology 201 about the critical role of calcium in binding to troponin, which then allows those actin and myosin cross bridges to form. So if you increase calcium influx into the cytoplasm of your cardiac muscle cells, that's going to lead to longer and more forceful contractions. And then there are hormones, all of which you will learn about in Unit 2 of Biology 202, your thyroxins, your thyroid hormones, glucagon, and epinephrine produced by your adrenal glands. Um, all of those are able to stimulate greater contraction force as well. Some things that decrease contractility, being in acidosis, if your body fluid pH is, is below normal, um, increased extracellular potassium ions, okay, that, that affects the, the charge difference across the membranes of your cardiac muscle fibers and makes it um, more difficult to depolarize them, leading to a contraction. Um, and then drugs, maybe you know somebody who's taking a calcium channel blocker. Those are drugs that block that the, the influx of calcium ions into the cardiac muscle fibers, which can lead to uh, stronger contractions. All right, so that's contractility. Um, a third thing that can affect your stroke volume, the volume of blood being ejected out of the ventricles is called afterload. Okay? Now, if you think about it, your ventricles are squeezing blood from the ventricles up into the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. The walls of those vessels have pressure in them as well because of the blood inside them. If you have the higher the pressure in the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, like if you, are, if you have hypertension, you have high blood pressure, the higher that pressure is, the more difficult it's going to be for your ventricles to squeeze hard enough to overcome that pressure. Because remember, those semilunar valves don't open up until the pressure in the ventricles exceeds the pressure in the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So if you have high blood pressure, if you have hypertension, and the pressure in the walls of your aorta and pulmonary trunk are higher than they should be, that's going to cause a delay in your semilunar valves opening. Now how is that going to affect your stroke volume? It's going to cause it to go down in this case. You're going to have less time during which the ventricles are contracting at the same time that those valve flaps are open, uh, during which you can squeeze blood upward into those blood vessels. 
So in contrast to the other two, uh, greater preload leads to an increase in stroke volume. Greater contractility of the muscle cells and the ventricles leads to an increase in stroke volume. Afterload and increase in afterload, though, leads to a decrease in stroke volume. So those are the, the three things that generally control stroke volume. So if you need to, if you're exercising, if you're being chased by a gorilla, um, you've just seen an alien land in your backyard, um, when you get stressed because you've got a biology 202 test coming up and you're starting to panic, um, these are all cases where your cardiac output goes up and that is generally going to occur by increasing the preload and or increasing the contractility of the cardiac muscle cells in the ventricles of your heart. Um, and on top of that, remember cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. So we just talked about what can cause your stroke volume to go up, but your heart rate generally goes up at the same time. You don't generally have an increase in this without simultaneously having an increase in your heart rate. And you want to jack that up as well because the faster you're pumping your blood through your cardiovascular system, the greater your cardiac output will be. Um, how is your heart rate regulated? Uh, you've already had a video lecture on this, so you guys know that you have nerve fibers, pff, nerve fibers within the parasympathetic branch of your autonomic nervous system that extend from the medulla oblongata. These nerve fibers are located in your vagus nerve, and there are branches that reach out and form, eventually form synapses with the SA node and the AV node of the cardiac conduction system. Remember the parasympathetic branch tends to decrease your heart rate, so it does that by causing the SA node and the AV node to depolarize less frequently. That slows down the, your heart rate the number of heartbeats that you'll have within one minute. And then you also have the sympathetic branch of your nervous system. And within that, we have nerve fibers that extend toward the heart. And they also form synapses at the SA node and the AV node. Okay, now they do the opposite. When they send neurotransmitters over to the SA node and the AV node, um, that causes the SA node to depolarize more quickly. So your heart rate goes up. If your depolarization occurs more frequently, you're going to have more frequent uh, contractions of the heart, so your heart rate will go up. But notice also you have branches of your sympathetic nervous system extending to and forming synapses with the walls of the ventricles, with the cardiac muscle cells in the walls of the ventricles themselves. So that's telling us that the sympathetic branch is also directly influencing things going on in the walls of the ventricles. I thought I had a separate slide on that, but I don't. Um, and what that is, the the norepinephrine or noradrenaline neurotransmitters that are released from the sympathetic branch of the nervous system here, when they bind to those cardiac muscle cells in the walls of your ventricles, they increase contractility. They cause your ventricular walls to contract with more force. And, and you guys know this. Just think about times when you're stressed out, you're panicking over something, or you get scared. What do you notice? Your heart rate goes up, and you know you can feel like your, your heart's going to beat out of your chest. That's because the contractility, those cardiac muscle cells in the walls of your ventricles, are contracting much more 
forcefully. Okay, and again there the idea is let's increase cardiac output. Okay, this is another one of those fairly complex diagrams in your textbook, but it's a really good one, and you should take a look at it because it's showing you the different physiological things, events that can occur and combine together to lead to an increase in cardiac output. So if you kind of look at the little diagram here, we know that increasing our stroke volume and increasing our heart rate, both of those will lead to an increase in cardiac output. Moving up the tree over here, these are all things that can lead to an increase in heart rate, exercise, fright, anxiety. Um, those impact your autonomic nervous system. Okay, you tend to increase sympathetic nervous system activity, you decrease parasympathetic, because remember parasympathetic you return to normal, and this leads to, based on what we just talked about and what you've heard in earlier lectures, an increase in heart rate. Um, and then more importantly for this particular lecture, increasing stroke volume. What will increase your stroke volume? Okay, exercise. When you're exercising, that increases the amount of blood returning to your heart. It speeds that up. More blood flows into the uh, ventricles with each heartbeat. So that's increasing your preload. You're pre-stretching the ventricles more so they can, your actin and your myosin filaments can have greater room to slide across each other. And that is going to cause more forceful contraction of the ventricles. You're going to squeeze more blood out with each contraction. Um, and then we also talked about as well, actually decreasing your heart rate as well. The slower your heart rate, the more blood can flow passively down into your ventricles with each heartbeat. That will increase your preload. Um, and then we also talked about increasing contractility in order to raise our stroke volume. And that is generally occurs through um, the sympathetic nervous system. We've got that little flow in there from over here on the other side. Sympathetic nerves directly influence cardiac muscle cells of the ventricles. But then uh, the hormone epinephrine released by the adrenal glands, you'll be learning about that in Unit 2, will uh, stimulate increased contractility. Same thing with thyroxin, the thyroid hormones, and excess calcium ions in your body fluids will also increase contractility. So be sure you, um, you check this diagram out in your textbook as well and make sure that you understand all of these things that you see here and why they are leading to increased stroke volume, increased heart rate, and finally increased cardiac output. All right, that looks like that's the end of this uh, particular lecture. If you have any questions about it, um, please feel free to uh, email me with any questions you may have. Thank you very much.